Hello, welcome to the training module for the North Carolina EMS Ketamine Pilot Project. My name is Brian Kitch. I'm an EMS doc representing the North Carolina chapter of the National Association of EMS Physicians. This lecture is free from financial conflicts of interest. During the course of this presentation, you'll be educated on ketamine as it pertains to the EMS pilot project. We will briefly touch on historical aspects of the medication and its pharmacology. Our focus will be on the clinical activity, adverse effects, and administration relevant to your practice in this project. Additional resources are available should you desire to learn more about this useful drug and its current applications in other fields of medicine. The Office of EMS has been granted permission to conduct this pilot project by the North Carolina Medical Board. While ketamine is currently used in EMS systems across the country, it is restricted medication in the paramedic scope of practice here limited to RSI and sedation of the intubated patient in the RSI-approved jurisdictions. Based on clinical experience and a large body of evidence, the North Carolina chapter of the National Association of EMS Physicians feels strongly that ketamine is appropriate for pre-hospital use. By conducting this pilot program, we aim to demonstrate that our highly trained and motivated North Carolina paramedics can administer ketamine safely. It is important to note that this is a pilot program, not a clinical trial. Ketamine is already an approved drug for many indications by the FDA. Its use is well within the standard of care in many institutions. We will begin our discussion on ketamine with a brief history lesson to put things in perspective. Ketamine was first synthesized in 1962 in a lab. It was tested on prisoners in 1964 and gained FDA approval in 1970, almost 50 years ago. Ketamine was derived from PCP with the goal of creating a drug with faster onset and less aggression that could be used for pain relief. It was successfully used on U.S. soldiers in Vietnam as a battlefield anesthetic. Shortly after its medicinal use, ketamine became a drug of abuse at parties and concerts. In 1999, ketamine became a controlled substance currently listed as a Schedule III narcotic. Ketamine has had a presence in the U.S. health system for some time. Initially, this medication was used primarily for sedation of pediatric patients for painful or frightening procedures. As procedural sedation became a core skill of emergency physicians, ketamine naturally transitioned into its role as a safe and effective adult medication. In very recent years, there have been an explosion of new uses for ketamine, including treating pain, severe depression, acute psychosis, and even asthma. Globally, ketamine has been embraced for years. In much of the developing world, ketamine is the only medication used for general anesthesia. Patients can undergo major surgery with just ketamine, providing pain relief and amnesia to the procedure. Ketamine is so highly important to the global health systems that it can be found in hospitals across the world more readily than oxygen or running water. The World Health Organization lists ketamine as one of the critically essential drugs to run a health system. The pharmacology of ketamine is the key to its desirable properties. Unlike traditional anesthetics, benzodiazepines, or opioids, this medication is not a direct CNS depressant. Ketamine can be classified as a dissociative anesthetic. At certain therapeutic doses, ketamine is able to induce a dreamlike state, disconnecting the higher order functions of the brain. While the individual will not be able to recognize pain or form memories, their airway, breathing, and cardiovascular systems are unimpaired. Ketamine acts as a sympathomimetic mitigating the cardiovascular deterioration caused by many other medications in the critically ill or injured patient. Ketamine also acts to modulate neurotransmitters, allowing it to function in many other applications outside the scope of this discussion. One unique property of ketamine is the ability of the drug to produce different clinical effects in a somewhat predictable dose-dependent fashion. At the lowest dose ranges, ketamine produces analgesia without causing major changes in mental status or hemodynamics. It has been well shown to be as effective as opioids in many patients without increased risks. With slightly more ketamine in the bloodstream, patients experience pleasurable changes in sensory perception. This is considered to be the recreational dosing when used as a drug of abuse. Further higher dosing can leave the patient in a state of hallucinations and unable to tell reality from dreams. This state of partial dissociation is often terrifying for patients and for providers. Higher doses still produce the often desired state of full dissociation. The patient will frequently have nystagmus at this time. They may exhibit some increased salivation. They will not be able to respond to stimuli, even intense pain. Occasionally, there may be some nonsensical noises or words uttered. 
when the ketamine is given correctly, respiratory depression should not occur, but one will notice an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Dosing higher than the recommended range for dissociation is not known to cause new or worsening symptoms. Merely, the patient will have a prolonged dissociation period, provided the medication was administered correctly. To demonstrate the effects of ketamine, we'll observe a pediatric patient receiving intravenous administration to cause full dissociation. Observe how the child acts as the medication takes effect. Look on camera. Good job, big boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, big boy, remember? We take a picture. Perfect. Perfect. Very rapidly after the medication was administered, the child became drowsy, looking around the room. He likely had some brief hallucinations and then became completely dissociated. In this state, the team was able to perform procedures that would ordinarily terrify a child of this age. His eyes remained open, but he had no connection to the world around him. He remained breathing and with favorable vital signs. It's important to note that there is overlap in the dosing ranges between the categories. What might be an analgesic dose for one patient could produce hallucinations in another. The specific dosing ranges are intentionally omitted from this presentation at this time. The protocols in the pilot are written with strict doses for adult patients only. By doing so, we aim to reduce the chance of straying into a different effect with the ketamine. It's important for us to discuss the most common and feared adverse effects of ketamine. Recall that ketamine is a sympathomimetic. It will cause an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. While this makes it an ideal agent in, say, the hypotensive trauma patient, one must weigh the risk and benefits of increasing hemodynamic parameters. When presented with an elderly patient with crushing chest pain and a cardiac history, other options may prove safer, or at least have more evidence proving their safety. Nausea and vomiting are a common side effect of most analgesic agents. Ketamine has, seems to have a similar incidence of this as medications as such as morphine. These symptoms can be treated in the usual fashion per your protocols. There are no substantial drug-drug interactions with ketamine and antiemetics. Thinking back to our ranges of ketamine, there is potential for a patient to have hallucinations and terror when partially dissociated. This condition, called ketamine dissociation syndrome, or emergence reaction can occur while a patient is progressing towards dissociation, but more often when waking up from a state of full dissociation. In this case, providing a calm, quiet, and safe environment can often de-escalate the patient until they metabolize their medication and calm down. Benzodiazepines can also be used to treat these symptoms. Ketamine can also cause apnea. It's true. While this medication is known for its ability to produce anesthesia with intact airway and breathing, apnea has occurred from time to time. Often this is a result of too rapid administration of a high concentration of ketamine. It's theorized that respiratory depression is more likely in a patient who has co-intoxications with other sedatives, including alcohol. This risk can be largely avoided by slow infusion of a dilute ketamine when given IV for analgesia. A good paramedic will at least consider the need for airway management when giving any medication, and ketamine is no exception. Laryngospasm is a feared but very rare complication of ketamine administration. This is a condition where, for unknown reasons, the vocal cords tightly shut, causing strider and airway impairment. Laryngospasm from ketamine usually responds to bag valve mask ventilation. Need for RSI or surgical airway is almost non-existent. In this video, observe a patient with a condition that very closely mimics laryngospasm. <laughs> She's sweating.
When given for the purpose of producing dissociation, as will be discussed on the behavioral indications for ketamine, the patient may arrive to the emergency department still dissociated. At times, this dissociation may last into the ED course. For some patients, this may be a prolonged sedation. There is a concern that when a patient arrives to the ED completely unresponsive after a dose of ketamine, the receiving staff may decide to intubate the patient despite their intact airway and breathing. Dogmatic training of GCS8 less than intubate contributes to this reflexive grab for the laryngoscope, as does a lack of provider familiarity with the dissociative effects of ketamine. While some patients may require intubation for other clinical factors, this pilot program's success depends on the receiving facilities having knowledge of ketamine in their initial phases of decision making. We will now discuss the indications for ketamine use in the pilot program and the specific features of the protocols. For those systems who are authorized to perform a drug-assisted airway, or RSI, ketamine is unchanged. This protocol is not affected by the pilot program. Recall that authorized systems still require two paramedic-level providers to administer ketamine for airway management. Also, remember that for these agencies, the paralytic need not be given should clinical conditions improve with just ketamine alone. Protocol UP6, Behavioral, is one of our two protocols where ketamine has been added as a part of the pilot program. You'll find it on the right-hand side in the management box for excited delirium syndrome. The dose is 400 milligrams intramuscular. This dose and route may not be modified in any way. The pearls of UP6 are updated to reflect ketamine as a therapeutic option. Note that this only applies to patients who are too large to fit on a pediatric length-based resuscitation tape. It is also limited to patients no older than age 65. Continuous end tidal CO2 monitoring is absolutely mandatory when ketamine is given in this way. Looking closely at the protocol, we see that ketamine is only indicated for use in excited delirium syndrome and only with a dose and route listed. It's very important for us to understand what excited delirium is not and in turn what patients would be appropriate candidates for ketamine administration. Excited delirium is not a patient who is simply angry. It is not a patient with severe emotional upset or depression. It is not a patient who is drunk and acting as such. It is not a patient who is high. It's not a patient with psychiatric disease who cannot be otherwise convinced to get into your ambulance. Patients with excited delirium are suffering from a life-threatening critical illness. Usually they will have tachycardia, hypertension, and a very high core temperature, none of which you will actually be able to measure or assess until the patient is sedated and the scene is secure. Untreated, the mortality is incredibly high, often from cardiovascular collapse. It is speculated that many patients with excited delirium die from the justified use of deadly force. Many times the medical system is never activated as the danger to the public is too high. This illustrates how severely agitated these patients can be. In this video, observe a patient who appears to be suffering from excited delirium syndrome. There he is right there. Hey, get on the ground! Hey, get on the ground! Sit down, man. Come on, man! Sit down! Sit down! Lay 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 down! Turn him over. Turn him over. Turn him Several important points can be taken from this video. The first responders on scene are primary law enforcement. This is often the case, as excited delirium, when witnessed by most, appears to be a dangerous and criminal individual. 
Notice that the patient is naked. Oftentimes, these patients will have life-threatening hyperthermia. He is covered in blood, representing either trauma he inflicted on himself or another being. He does not seem phased by this, illustrating the psychiatric effects of this illness. When he encounters the fence and law enforcement, his resistance to pain and his pathologic strength is fully evidence. These individuals are a danger to themselves and others. Ketamine has also been added to protocol UP11, pain control. On the bottom right of this page, you'll find ketamine in the column for moderate to severe pain after application of the cardiac monitor is performed. Note that this only applies to patients who are too large to fit on a pediatric length-based resuscitation tape. It is also limited to patients no older than age 65. Ketamine is given at a dose of 0.2 mg per kilogram with an absolute maximum dose of 20 mg. It may be given IV or IO. For example, a 70 kg patient would receive 14 mg of ketamine. A 120 kg patient would receive 20 mg, the ceiling dose in this protocol. The ketamine must be mixed in a bag of saline between 50 ml to 250 ml, depending on what you have available. This must be infused over 10 minutes. The dose, route, dilution, and infusion rates may not be modified in any way. The pearls of protocol UP11 have been updated to reflect ketamine's addition. Continuous and tidal CO2 monitoring is mandatory after administration. Again, we are reminded to dilute the ketamine in 50 to 250 milliliters of saline and infuse over 10 minutes. Remember to monitor for side effects. One factor to consider when acquiring and administering ketamine is available concentrations. Currently, this medication is supplied in three concentrations, 10 mg per milliliter, 50 mg per milliliter, and 100 mg per milliliter. While the pilot program does not mandate which vials are purchased, your agency must weigh several factors and also prepare for flexibility with drug shortages. The two new indications for ketamine, behavioral and pain control, have very different doses and routes. As an example, the dose for excited delirium is 400 mg. If an agency had only the 10 mg per milliliter ketamine, this would be 40 milliliters intramuscular. This is not a viable or pleasant option for a patient. Similarly, the maximum dose of ketamine for pain control is 20 mg. If an agency had only the 100 mg per milliliter concentration, the paramedic would have to draw up two tenths of a milliliter of ketamine. We must also be mindful that having vials of medication which look and feel similar but have vastly different doses is a setup for medication errors. In our last section, we will discuss the logistics and documentation needed for a system to participate in the pilot project. The requirements for participation in the program appear here. They serve to ensure that ketamine is part of your quality improvement program. By collecting EMS and hospital data, we will track each administration and monitor safety. Training of all providers is essential, and OEMS needs to know your plans for doing so. Compliance with the listed requirements is mandatory. In order to avoid adverse events from your receiving facility having no experience with ketamine, letters of support from, from facilities must be submitted to OEMS. It is recommended that this letter serves only as the minimum and that your agency does outreach with the hospital to ensure the staff is comfortable receiving your ketamine patients and is knowledgeable about the clinical effects of this medication. When you decide to implement the protocols, you must submit a protocol change form. You must accept protocols UP6 and UP11 as they were written and featured here today. No changes are allowed. Each time a provider administers ketamine, they must complete this form. Note that the form collects data regarding dose, co-administered medication, adverse outcomes, airway issues, and other important factors. This form must be signed for, by a physician or a provider at the receiving facility with regards to their need for immediate airway management. The form must be reviewed and signed off by the medical director. Any adverse outcomes as listed on this form must be reported to OEMS within 48 hours of occurrence. This form is also mandatory for patients receiving ketamine during the pilot project. It collects hospital data and seeks to capture any other adverse events, such as prolonged sedation. Any events listed in red must be reported to OEMS within 48 hours. The ideal emergency department receiving patients in this pilot program would be one that has a good working relationship with the EMS agency. It would be staffed by knowledgeable emergency physicians and nurses who regularly utilize ketamine in the clinical practice. This ideal emergency department would be supportive and enthusiastic about EMS starting to treat their patients' pain 
and save lives in the rare excited delirium cases. Should your service not already have these ideal conditions, it is strongly urged to meet with the providers in the emergency department. The hospital needs to not only be aware of what EMS is doing in this program, they also need to have some fundamental knowledge of the effects of ketamine. Share your training and your education with your hospitals and help ensure the success of this program. While this pilot program does allow our providers to utilize new tools, they remain just one option in the many other therapies in the formula, formulary. There is no need to try using ketamine just for the purposes of the program. If a service never administers a dose, this is not a failure of the program. Safe and proper administration is the focus. It should go without saying, but the decision to administer ketamine is a medical decision made by the paramedic alone. The behavioral dose is very rapid in onset and can chemically restrain a patient within seconds to minutes. Under no circumstances should you allow yourself to be compelled to administer this medication outside the protocol by other providers, physicians, or law enforcement. When complete, this pilot project will prove what we already know, that North Carolina paramedics can use ketamine to improve patient care across the state. This concludes the educational module. Additional resources and reading material may be found by following this link.